Intercultural awareness. One thing to know is about no technology is reliable. Technology is just as unreliable as human beings. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I've already done right? a formal, formal introduction. I've read out all your various credentials. Um, and I think we can probably move on. Thank you so much for your, um, your input today. And um, yeah, take it away. Thank you, Yong. <laughs> Well, thank you. I, I want to caution you again, the internet might get disrupted. I may look very funny and strange, uh, but I will, let's persist with this. This is part of uh, dealing with technology. Uh, actually, we can start by talking about that. It's, uh, I've been thinking a lot about how things can go wrong, okay? Uh, that is really part of being a creative global citizen, whatever it is. Things go wrong, and what you do. I don't know what you guys did other than reading my long bio. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> but the, the big piece, I'm re raising, I mean, China now has to do with technology, with unreliability. Uh, so let me first start by talking about how schools are broken, like a technology. You know, if you look at schools, schools basically, schooling is a piece of technology, okay? And one of the problems that when schools are broken, it doesn't serve our kids well, and uh, more importantly, it doesn't serve our future well. And the, the theme, I think, of your conference, of summit, um, excites me. And the way, because you're running this, from, have students involved, also inspires me. Uh, the, uh, the big reason is that, as you know, uh, we have a president called Donald Trump. I can talk about him now in China, you know, and he's, uh, he's in America, it's not good. Messed me uh, up, you know. And you know what? It's a classic example of um, isolationism, which because they come from uh, isolated classrooms. You saw the tragedy happening in uh, New Zealand. You see all of these places. So we blame a lot of politicians. I know in Australia, you have the rise of nationalism, for example, uh, all those uh, racism. You see the rise everywhere. And that's actually an education problem. You know, we can blame them as bad because all these bad people have once been in your classroom. So you're all to blame. I hope you can think about that. But don't blame yourself. They're not graduates of your school. Okay. So maybe some other schools. And so as a, as a broken technology, how do we fix it? I think that's the key. How do we actually fix this thing? And uh, I'm in China. I'm in a big city now. It's called Chongqing. And maybe your schools get become part of this network. I've been spending 10 days in a school that's 5,000 students, only grades seven, eight, nine. So you will say, what are you doing there? You know, I'm here following students really from like 7:30 to 9:30. That's how hard to study. There's middle school students, seventh graders. Can you imagine how many how many hours? 7:30. I I don't mean wake up. I mean they start working. 7.30, the end at 9.30, and I have been with them for the past 10 days, and uh, just and I realized I'm actually just too old for them, you know, for these people. It's, uh, and I asked the students, I said, are you tired? They said, well, we're not tired. We're tired of what we've been taught. So okay, physically, they're not being tired, but they are, being, they are tired. So um, many of you might know Richard Elmore was here, and we're actually hang out, try to transform this school, try to fix it. And the big part of fix is our educational outcomes. Our educational outcomes have been defined for an old time. For the technology of steam engines, for the technology of electricity. And so our goal in all of our schools are to prepare individual students to be identical workers on the assembly line. And because, so that's why you have the Australian curriculum, you have a state curriculum. You know, all those curriculum, in essence, is a piece of technology, it's a device to make our children identical. 
And if we are not successful in making them identical, it's your fault. It's a teacher's fault. If the students are not acquiring the minute piece of knowledge at the same space, at the same pace, we call you are being falling behind. Teachers are to blame, schools are to blame, but we don't blame the device. You know, NAPLAN, for example, is a big corporate, you know. NAPLAN, what does NAPLAN do? NAPLAN basically measures how successful you are in making everybody the same. You know, of course, you know, if you have that outcome, it defines the technology, and, but, you know, our children are not the same. Right? You know that. So that's why all we see in that kind of school, children are fixed problem. You know, without children, schools will run very smoothly. You know, you know, we got kids, that's the problem. They just it's a children, you know, they are they're just too different, you know. And but that difference, do you try to work to cultivate that diversity or do you try to homogenize diversity? So in the old, old industrial age, our job is to homogenize them so they can be the same kind of workers. And not only homogenize them, but homogenize them for local economy, for local society. So we train them to think about everybody else, not only foreigners. Everybody else is a competitor. That's our with it, because we are the same, so you compete with others. Imagine your ATAR score in Australia, and the ATAR, your ATAR is basically what I would call a tool to manufacture losers. You know, you, you, you have, uh, because you have only, you, you, you do with the percentile, you will have a few people succeed at the top, then the rest are losers. So a lot of times, if you're not good at school, your best contribution is to make other people look good. You know, that, 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 that's, the, that, that's kind of the, the model we have. And in that regard, we're teaching our students to be very selfish. Because if one, there's only a few people can occupy at the top end, the rest kind of go down. So what we need to shift that thinking is to say, diversity actually is very valuable. That is, we live off. anything sensitive but just <laughs> so uh, but anyway so if you look at our curriculum today we all want our children to do you know math and math literacy all of those things and uh, those are basic things I have no argument against but at the same time if you look what we sacrifice in our children everybody has strength we are born to have different biases in our talent. Some are talented towards music, others art, some people with their physical movement, others with you know with science, others with numbers. You know, so we have different students come together as diverse. We have different personalities, some are more extrovert, some are introverted, you know. But all those diversities, when you use one curriculum to make a judgment about them. Some are, you know, good students, if they happen to be talented in math and language. But if you're talented in art and music, but relatively weak, in math, you're considered a liability because the society finds you not very useful. That, that's, 
And which is true, you know, like, you know, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, if you have good art, you probably are not going to make a living because we, the traditional society did not very much enjoy uh, crazy people. Like uh, I, I used to say, Lady Gaga would be useless for Henry Ford. You just imagine, it. And that's just, now would you, you don't want to hire her, you know, all this kind of stuff. It's a, and most actually excellent people were not very useful, you know, just, you know. But today, the society has changed. That is, every human talent can be valuable and useful. Uh, I, I tell the story of, uh, of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Rudolph had a red nose, and that was a problem for him. In the village of reindeers, the curriculum was a measurement of the color of your nose. So Naplan would say, red are bad, black's good. So Rudolph was a bad student and put into special education. You, know, you want to homogenize it. So, okay, so special ed. You, we need to fix the deficit. You know. But on a foggy Christmas Eve, you got Santa Claus who's looking for a for GPS. We got his sled. You know, so the, but suddenly, the redness, the redness becomes valuable, becomes useful, becomes powerful. So children today all over the world are thankful the special education programs in the reindeer republic did not work very well. Otherwise, we would not have any Christmas gifts. Okay. So, I want you to keep thinking about that. When you make judgment in your school about a student, about a child, you are defining that person's future. So if you look at those napkins, okay, you're just so bad, let me fix you. You need to be careful that fixing is that valuable. But by fixing, as I said before, we make them the same, so they would be competing in the same domain, they would become very selfish. However, there's another you know, human story I tell is that uh, the human equivalent of something useful becoming, something useless become useful, or some people, useless people become useful, is uh, an American called Kim Kardashian. Okay, that's, uh, so Kim Kardashian is practically useless in most places, you know, just, uh, but somehow she has a huge following. She's making money, she's making a living off people's fascination with her, whatever that thing is, right? So you know, there's no, no talent involved. But you need to ask yourself, if Kim Kardashian can be useful in some way, anyone can be useful. <laughs> That is actually true. I don't have time to go into the details to analyze that. I just have to believe that if you look hard, what we used to consider useless talent, useless knowledge has truly, truly become valuable. Like art. Just think about art. Art is a good example. Really, 100, 200 years ago, if you're, you're an artist, you know how many artists starve to death or kill themselves before they starve to death? You know, you, you know that, right? It's, uh, it, really, practically, who would care about art? You know, and in the, the, there are a few people that do it around, they do some art, but today, you notice how many artists we need? Everything has become art. You know, you, are, you, 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 you do your hairstyle, you do, I can still see some beautiful hairs there, you know, you, in the audience, you know, you guys are done. You must have a good, you know, hairstylist, you know, you have interior designers, you need a video game designers, you have beautiful bags, everything's custom designed, you know, even food has become art. You know, that's why the more money you pay, the less food you get. Yeah. Because you are doing art, you know, it's, it's art. And then, you know, we, we got all kinds of, so art actually, the people involved in art today actually is probably more than people involved in manufacturing, car making. It's because everybody is doing that thing. But just look at our schools. Have we shifted our mindset to respect art students? No. I'm not talking about the good student with a naplan, with a literacy numeracy, and at art. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, if you want to become great at something, you actually cannot be great at everything. You have to make a choice. You have to make a choice. Because you know, we, we know greatness comes from three things. Talent, time, and teaching. 
So if you are born without any talent in a domain, no matter how much time you spend, you won't become great. But if you spend the same amount of time, you know, people talk about 10,000 hours. If, you know, if you, to, you need to spend 10,000 hours if you want to be good at something. You know, in our schools, typically 16,000 hours for 12 years. So if you want to be good at one thing, you spend six, 10,000 hours. But if you, if you spend 10,000 hours on something you have talent for, you truly become great. Okay, you truly become great. But if you spend 10,000 hours on something you really have no talent for, you are going to become okay, because you can learn, you can become mediocre. Okay, you can become mediocre. An example for me, I've been encouraged in Australia. People, there's a lot of people who believe you know, the growth mindset. Yeah, I believe you can learn anything, you can, your, your intelligence is malleable, you can change. I said, yeah, yes, yes. So again, in Australia, people say, why don't you go play Australian football? I said, I don't like it. I, I said, I'm not good. I said, I said, well, I can teach you. I'm sure you play better if after practice, 10 hours, 10,000 hours. I said, yeah, sure. But what I'm going to do, who is going to hire me? And, and I don't get, get crushed in the, in the field. I'm just a little tiny Chinese boy, you know. <laughs> can make a living based on that. So, so that, I, I won't be great at all without that. So this is why sometimes if you're not smart, if, if, if the growth mindset, growth mindset is not applied smartly, it's called stupidity. <laughs> okay? Let's do this. You know, we believe you can learn anything, you can do it. Oh, I'm here. I'm still here. <laughs> so, so that, 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 well, another T is teaching. Teaching has to you know, so if you want to become great, talent, time, teaching. Teaching means that 10,000 hours is not the same as one hour repeated 10,000 times. You know, one problem in our teaching is we repeat. You, if you want to learn something, you need to vary, you need to change, you need to do something different. So that, that's, that's, that's dramatic. So now if we, this is what I call strength-based learning, make you become great. What do you do with your greatness? Is you create value for others. That's called entrepreneurship. That's called creativity. And you create value for others. You solve other people's problems because as human beings, if you want to be happy, you want to be genuinely happy, you need to be valuable to other people. Human beings cannot be happy just doing things for themselves. This is called uh, Maslow's psychology will talk about self-actualization, self-realization, self-transcendence. It's about using your greatness to create value for other people. But how do you create value for other people if they have the same talent? This is why it's so important to teach our children to know that be good at something, don't try to be good at something else. And, and try to be good at everything. Because you can't be and you should not be. And so allow children to recognize their strength and weakness because your weakness creates opportunity for others to help you. Look at yourself, you're, you're sitting over here. Look at your body, what you wear, what your hair like, you are relying on other experts to contribute to your life. I'm sure all of you, if you want to spend time, you can learn to make clothes, you can learn to do your hair, you can learn to, to do whatever, but you don't do it. Why? Because you cannot be expert in everything. And the, uh, the fact you cannot do something creates opportunity for other people. So I want to encourage you to run away from your weaknesses. Try not to be good at everything. That's all my life's lesson. I've been running away from things I am not good at. Uh, I, I'm, uh, I'm able to speak English because I was bad at a lot of things. You know, I, I went to school because I was bad at farming. You know, I'm uh, about two hours away from my father's village here uh, in Chongqing, near city. And he's still there in the village. When I was a, uh, you know, a kid, a boy, my, my, my village curriculum, the core curriculum was driving the water buffalo, OK? 
okay? I used the water bubble to plow the field. That was absolutely horrible. No interest, bad. And uh, my father did not send me to a special education program to fix my water buffalo driving skills. <laughs> See, if we were measuring about not planning in water buffalo driving, I would have dragged down the low, the average of my village. But my father was wise. He said, well, since you're bad at this, then why don't you go to school? So, so that's a good way to avoid messing up my village. So I left my village, the village has become better. So that, that's my contribution, okay? And then I, I, I learned to, so that's how I went to school. And then, well, as soon as I went to school, I began to create value for somebody else. Because I was small, tiny, I was bullied all the time. As soon as I went to school, my weakness of not being physically strong allowed me to outsource my personal protection to the big boys. So they, they did my homework, I did, their, uh, they, I did their homework and let them copy my exam, and they did my fighting. So that was really perfect, called genuine collaboration, true, authentic collaboration, okay? So that's what you create value. So I want to bring this back. I know uh, we're running out of time. Uh, the idea about in a global citizen, I think as a global citizen, we need to understand human diversity is essential for stability and prosperity. As in any biological ecosystem, biodiversity is essential for the sustainability of the ecosystem. And all this is connected in that way. So how do we help our children understand diversity is key? Everybody of the same ideas, same talent is no good. Actually, there's a lot of empirical evidence, research supporting a diverse work group, a diverse school, actually do much better. You know, so I hope actually as staff, as teachers, you hire people who are different from you, make friends who are different from you. It can be difficult, can be challenging. It's actually very, very valuable. So that's, that's not only about a global, but it's very local, we need to do the, the, the same thing. So the broken school of technology, try to make everybody the same. We do not celebrate diversity. We do not create opportunity for children to diversify. So I hope in your global, your international summit, when you see students from different places, cherish that. But do push your students to ask. Do push your, how do you matter to other people? You're good at something, but how do you matter? Who cares? How do, how do, you, how do you become valuable with others? And also have, help students understand your value can only be realized through other people. You only value. Like I was saying, this thing, you know, I, I know you guys make a lot of wine, for example. If nobody drinks the wine, the wine is of no value. So that, that's, that's another mess. How do you, so that's where you come to the idea about entrepreneurship and creativity. But there's another piece. When I look at um, nationalism, uh, when I look at Trump, is all this phenomenon, Brexit, in all this social instability happening right now is really the result of an education that has not adapted to a new society. Every time when a revolution happens, it redefines the value of knowledge. It resets the social order. Like, you know, in the, culture, in the Industrial Revolution made farming skills much less valuable, but required new skills. But education is supposed to be the one to re-equip children to take advantage of the new society, new possibilities, rather than trying to keep them the same as before. So, but be, schools always try to catch up to technology. This is, there's a race between education and technology. Technology pushes forward, redefines the value of talents. Education is supposed to teach that so the majority of the society can enjoy prosperity that comes with the technology. But until education does that, you only get a few very wealthy people and most people become poor. So you have a widening income gap. When, you, when, the, when the middle class disappears, you have social instability. Then we begin to blame other people. 
Blame, blaming foreigners the best. The xenophobia rock keeps rising. We used two wars to settle this. 19, uh, 1918, 1940, remember all those two world wars to resettle the whole thing. Now we the time that has disrupted. So you see the social instability really comes from a big proportion of our, pop, our population cannot take advantage of technology yet. But, and, and cannot adapt to the new society because our schools as a technology is broken. We need to fix it. And that fix has to be rethinking the paradigm shift. We've been trying to fix the wrong things. In, in, I think, again, in Australia, we fix the curriculum. You know, I said, well, we need to, do, uh, we have now AI, artificial intelligence. Therefore, everybody needs to learn how to do coding. You know, we need a financial leaders that teach that. That was called tinkering. The tinkering doesn't matter. It doesn't work in that way. You know, you cannot tinker, tinker uh, you cannot tink, uh, uh, tinker with the horse wagon to go to the moon. You can go to the moon, you better start work on the rocket. Okay, so that's the, that's the whole idea. So I'll leave you with that message today, is that um, technology is really driving a lot of changes. Schools needs to change the outcome measures, the goals. We can no longer be isolated in the classrooms. Our children need to get out. Our children need to be diverse and more diverse. Our schools used to be a garden. We cultivate one type of flowers. Gardeners are the most horrible people. They decide who gets into the garden, okay? So now we need to move. Schools, a better metaphor will be Schools are nature reserves where every species is worth cultivating and supporting. Thank you.